Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, sure. thank you so much. So, um, good, good afternoon, dear students, faculty members, uh, and all the others who have joined to this uh, very innovative webinar on a topic called as design thinking. My dear students, uh, those who are into first years now and those who are into second year, we have been talking about innovation and as well as entrepreneurship development activity at our campus. And first and foremost to think for this innovation is to have an idea. And for having an idea, you have to have how this idea can be generated. What, are the, what is the process of generation of an idea? That to an idea which is viable uh, uh, through various angles or through various parameters. And that's why we have a very eminent personality today who is going to talk on the topic called as design thinking. This seminar or webinar, whatever you call it as, is a really very, very interesting one. It would be an interesting one. And so I request all of you to take your pen and pencil and paper with you and note down whatever the today's speaker is going to talk about. Let me introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Kaustub Dargalkar. Uh, it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Kaustub Dargalkar on this platform of D.Y. Patil University School of Pharmacy in Navi Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Kaustub yeah. is a yoga practitioner. Dear student, note it. He is a very avid yoga practitioner. An entrepreneur turned into academician. He is a PhD in corporate innovation and design thinking. In my uh, life so far, I am seeing the first person who has done his doctorate into uh, design thinking. Okay, so PhD in corporate innovation and design thinking. He is consultant to many, many corporates like HP, Mercedes-Benz, Citibank, Capgemini, Mahindra, etc. And he typically consult them on how to enhance innovation quotient. You must have heard intelligent quotient, emotional quotient, but this is something new. He consult to the corporates on innovation quotient. He was recognized as top seven global innovators at a competition held in Barcelona in 2015 for a poster, comp poster competition. He has two TEDx talks to his credit. He has trained more than 5,000 individuals and uh, has given more than 50,000 training uh, hours to the people. Visiting faculty at IIT Bombay, IIMS uh, Simsar, and ICT V School, NMIMS, etc. He's recipient of Entrepreneurship Education, a Educator and Mentor Award by the Government of India, and also featured on uh, Changemaker Show of Subhash Chandra on ZTV. And list of achievement of Dr. Kaustubi is a very long. However, I want that you people enjoy his talk, lo uh, ask lots of questions, let us have an interactive session. So to begin with, uh, I request all of you to keep, your, uh, keep yourself muted. If you have a question, you can put the question in the chat box. I will take those questions. Uh, or maybe Dr. Kostub himself can take the question at suitable point of time. And uh, let us uh, learn a lot. Let us make this Saturday afternoon a very, very fruitful afternoon for all of us. So that on Sunday, we think on today's topic and uh, plan something from Monday onwards. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to you, Dr. Kaustup Dargalkar, on our platform. Over well, to you, sir. Thank you very much for the very generous, kind introduction. Uh, introductions always sound very glamorous. <laughs> so, <laughs> after the one hour of my speaking, let me see. Let us see if you really like it or not. That time we can uh, get back to that. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, a very good afternoon to all uh, on a spending time on a Saturday afternoon. Well, but nowadays uh, a weekend is also a weekday and a weekday is also a weekend, depends on how you look at it. So days and time and geography doesn't really have much of a significance these days. All right, let me share my uh, screen with you. Uh, yeah. Yes, can you see my uh, yes. screen? Yes. Okay. All right, so let us jump straight into design thinking. What is uh, design thinking? Uh, it is a problem solving approach which puts an extremely high em emphasis on the user, understands the user very, very deeply. There are various methods that uh, one can borrow from a designer's toolkit to understand users without having to ask them, uh, by just observing them, by interacting with them, 
but not really with a questionnaire and a survey kind of method. So that's the whole, uh, you know, uh, that's what a designer brings to the table while he or she solves a problem. And the way he solves or she solves the problem is very iterative, continuous exploration throughout the process. Now, uh, rather than talking about the definition of uh, design thinking, let us understand how it works and why it is called design thinking. Uh, say, suppose you, you, know, you go to visit a school of design, say something like National Institute of Design or uh, maybe an industrial design center at uh, any of these IITs, you will find that the way uh, the sessions are taken, the way the classes are conducted is quite different from the way we are used to in conventional education uh, systems. Uh, the 10 plus 2 plus, uh, you know, the graduation kind of method that we've gone through. Typically, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, maybe imagine uh, day one of a bachelor's of design program. Uh, uh, students uh, have assembled in class and one professor just walks into the class and uh, directly gives the students an assignment and say maybe uh, says, uh, you know, uh, so design or create a container of water for students like yourselves, which means the faculty, the professor has given the a target group for the students to create a bottle, a container of water. Uh, instant response of most of the students is to take a piece of paper, draw an outline of a bottle and submit the assignment and think it is over. Uh, the prof looks at it and says, uh, well, this is fine, but uh, have you even consulted the end user? Which means uh, the prof is saying that, please go out in the field, understand what the end user really seeks and needs from a container of water. Uh, the target given is a student like yourself, means somebody 17 to 22 year old college or university student. So over the week, these people, these kids, the students interact with other people like themselves and on the go kind of figure out that, uh, you know, he or she, the student is out of his or her house for typically between 12 to 14 hours a day uh, when he or she goes to college. Carry, carries a bottle of water in a backpack. In the backpack, there is a laptop possibly there are some notebooks, there are some pencils, rubbers, compass box, X, Y, Z. Uh, now, from all this, uh, they figure out that since the student is out of the house for 12 to 14 hours, means what should be the capacity of the bottle of water? The fact that it is stored in a backpack kind of dictates what kind of shape it should have. It should be easy to insert, it should be easy to take out, it should be slick in shape. The fact that uh, the bottle is stored along with a laptop and uh, 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 some notebooks determines that the bottle should not leak, otherwise everything else in the bag will get spoiled. So on the base and more such findings they get, but they get it from the field firsthand, not through their imagination only. Uh, basis this, they create another kind of a modified shape of the bottle and draw it and submit it to the uh, professor next week, in the next week's class. The professor looks at it and uh, says, uh, uh, well, this is good. You've changed it, refined it, fine. But all of this is in two dimensions, is in 2D. I would like to have a three-dimensional prototype of the same thing, which means the prof is pushing the students to the laboratory maybe a 3D printing laboratory or some molding laboratory, etc. cetera. Um, after a week of struggling with creating models, etc., the students come back with a 3D model of the bottle uh, and submit it to the prof thinking this is over. Uh, professor looks at it, says, good, but uh, have you actually tried it on some end users? Which means the prof is once again pushing the students to take trials of whatever they have designed. Once, uh, you know, that takes about a couple of weeks. 
uh, when they try it out, when they give it out to people to take some feedback, they get some feedback, the prototype gets modified, maybe a couple of times it gets modified and maybe at the end of the fifth week or so, uh, students think, wow, that now my ass assignment is over. Uh, prof uh, looks at it and says, well, it's better than last time, but how many people did you try it on? Uh, students say, maybe we tried the sample on about three or four people. Professor says, uh, well, not enough. Try it on, on more people. That means once again, the prof is pushing the students back into the field to get some more feedback. And this goes on for another two, three weeks. Uh, and after, you know, again, they come back with refinements. Again, the prof pushes, have you to expand your sample a little more and maybe after you know 20 30 uh, sample size and seven eight iterations to the whole issue uh, to the whole design uh, after maybe 12 or 15 weeks of that trimester program finally a very different kind of a prototype comes out much more refined than what they had started at the beginning and finally the assignment is accepted now i told you an instance of just one subject like this but uh, in a design school, a bachelor's program is a three-year program, and they do probably 25 to 30 subjects. And uh, out of those 25 to 30 subjects, 90% of the professors or the faculty adopt a very similar approach of pushing, continuously pushing the students into the field, getting feedback, refining, creating prototypes, and you know, the same iterative approach. Now imagine three years of doing this, going through 25 subjects like this and almost every prof adopting the same methodology. What do you think must be happening to the mindset of that student? Naturally, the mindset of the student becomes extremely user-centric without having told them the definition of what user-centric means. Because every time they are pushed into the field to find out real problems and when people go into the field, they realize that the problems that they were thinking of are completely different from what actually happens on the field. And that's where the real learning happens. And if you can pick up problems like that, then you'll be really solving real problems. Otherwise, many a times we solve some imagined problems, which on the field are actually very different. So from this example, you must have realized that, that human-centric or user-centric behavior becomes second nature for a, for a designer when he or she approaches problem solving. It is exploratory because it's a constantly evolving process and it is iterative because it constantly keeps on depending on the feedback that is received from the user. So the students who pass out of a design school really have, have this kind of an approach and ideation in vacuum doesn't really happen uh, because they are constantly trained to figure out real problems, understand present issues, forecast what are the anticipating trends and necessarily create something which will be useful today and tomorrow and for the future as well. So it is a very strongly user-centric approach to problem solving. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, Stanford University uh, defines uh, the design thinking process in these five blocks. Uh, let's quickly get over the theory before we jump into practical examples. Uh, empathize. Empathize means the ability to put yourselves in the shoes of the end user, to understand the problem from the perspective of the end user. After having done that, the problem definition possibly changes because what you had probably defined gets a different meaning when you start understanding what the user is defining it as. Once that problem is defined, there is a phase of ideation, generation idea, generating of generation of ideas, all kinds of wild ideas. So. Uh, a lot of divergence happens here when a lot of imagination comes into, comes into the picture. Then when you actually create a physical prototype or a system prototype to kind of test it out with real users, you test it out with real users, get some feedback. And once again, you know, prototyping, testing kind of keeps on happening. Sometimes you have to come back to the empathy stage, going back to the user, initial user to get a feedback, come back, create a prototype. So it's a back and forth process, but broadly defined by these five terms, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. Now having kind of put the whole design thinking definition in context, let us see what happens uh, because of design thinking. Uh, why design thinking? It's deeply user-centric because of which 
the uh, user is at the center right from the un uh, stage of understanding the problem to defining the problem to generating the ideas to prototyping and testing because of which the probability of innovation to happen increases because you are constantly in touch with the needs of the user the latent unarticulated needs of the user and consequently the risk of obsolescence also goes down the risk of your product or service becoming obsolete also goes down because you're constantly in touch with the needs of the user and you are constantly marrying that finding with what is going to happen by anticipating trends so it not only enhances the probability of innovation to happen but consequently it reduces the risk of obsolescence as well and it shows uh, day uh, it shows the path when it is always day one by day one what i mean is uh, you know when uh, the universe got created after the big bang everything that was happening was new there was no precedence to what was happening there was there were no set ways to solve problems which were coming up because it was all happening for the first time and in today's situation uh, whether in business or society or technology things are changing so rapidly that there are no precedents to problems that that are coming up which means you have to have a problem solving approach which is ingrained in the present and combines the upcoming trends and then find solutions design thinking with its extreme emphasis on the user makes you more comfortable in trying to solve such problems which have no precedent so it shows the path when it is always day one so now by now you must have kind of figured out that the building block of design thinking is really deep empathy which leads to human centricity uh what i uh, understand from this is you need to really understand users in their context how do they behave how do they use stuff how do they how do they use products that don't belong to you belong to your competition how do they what do they complain about it what would they wish those products would have and if you can learn from all of that your product service offerings will be much much better which is what i call as last mile user connect that means understanding the user at the last mile uh, without really defining it let us understand uh, this term with some examples let us look at what happens without last mile user connect all right uh, in front of you on screen is a plasma screen a white screen tv uh, this was launched first by philips and then by sony uh, but they didn't really market this product too well the first company to market this product well was sharp electronics the japanese company and they launched this t television somewhere in i think in 2001 back then these kinds of blockbuster home appliance products would be launched first in the us then in europe and then across the world today these launches happen simultaneously i'm going to tell tell you the story of the launch way back in 2001 normally uh, these uh, this is a blockbuster home appliance right and uh, this these kinds of products generally get launched in the pre christmas uh, sale period uh, through the retail chains uh, this was launched on uh, black friday which is the second last friday of november when all retail sales open for their pre discount i mean pre uh, pre christmas uh, shopping season Uh, this was launched by sharp electronics in collaboration with the largest uh, uh, consumer appliance home home electronics uh, uh, chain uh, retail chain in us called best buy electronics back then best buy electronics had uh, something like uh, 85 90 stores across the country usa sharp tied up with them because they had the maximum reach uh, normally the understanding between the retailer and the manufacturer is such that if there is any unsold stock at the end of a specific sale period the unsold stock will have to be taken back by the manufacturer or there will be a debit note raised against the manufacturer which means if there is any unsold stock it will be not to the account of the retailer but it will be the, to the account of the manufacturer that means the onus or the burden of sale is not on the retailer but on the manufacturer 
that's the normal standard practice between a retailer and a manufacturer. Sharp Electronics uh, said that this product is so superior to what existed, what televisions existed back then, those you know, cathode ray tube TVs uh, back then. Uh, they said that this product will sell like hotcakes. Uh, forget about you having to hold inventory at the end of the sale period. You will probably have to reorder more from us. And uh, after showing the demonstration of this product to the Shah, to the uh, Best Buy people, uh, Best Buy also agreed this product is really going to sell like hotcakes. Instead of uh, worrying about holding inventory at the end of the sale period, we will we might have to reorder it. Now, uh, so so they they uh, uh, you know the the deal got reversed uh, that uh, the onus of sale was now on the retailer, not on the manufacturer. And this agreement was signed probably for the very few times in retail history this must have happened. But uh, Sharp was able to convince Best Buy to sign this reverse kind of a deal. Uh, this product was launched in uh, with a lot of pomp and show on uh, 2001 Black Friday. Uh, Best Buy thought this will really sell like hotcakes. Two weeks went by barely anything was sold barely three to four percent of the inventory was sold so naturally the uh, stress of selling of holding the inventory was now on best buy electronics and not on sharp uh, the best buy folks were really worried how to now we need to really find the reason why people are not buying such a superior product this is much better engineered much better designed than what existed back then those cathode ray tube tvs so instructions came from the top of uh, uh, Best Buy Electronics, the CEO of Best Buy Electronics, to all the store managers across the country, asking them, please check in your catchment areas. Catchment area means about 20 mile radius around the store from where people come to their store to buy, buy stuff from their stores. Uh, the CEO said, please send out small teams of people to people's houses and please check and interact with people in their households and find why people are not buying such a superior product. And the instructions were very clear. You will not conduct surveys of people who walk into the stores. You will go into people's houses to understand in their context. And this went on for about five, the next five days. Each store manager must have sent, must have sent about, you know, in their own catchment area, they must have visited about 15 to 20 stores. 90 such stores across the country means they had done home visits to almost 1,500 to 1,800 households. And uh, one of the most common reasons why people were not buying such a superior product was downright silly. Back in the early 2000s, televisions had not quite invaded our bedrooms. There used to be generally one TV in the house. Today we have television almost in every room. But back then there used to be one and that used to be in the drawing room. And where in the drawing room? Normally there used to be a big wall cabinet with a showcase and storage space, etc. And in the center there used to be a slot for placing the television. Now that slot in that furniture used to be square in shape according to the old style TV. And this was a rectangular flat screen TV would not go in. <laughs> people would not want to change their expensive furniture just to accommodate a new television. That was the plain and simple reason why people were not buying this television. Because Sharp had not envisaged that this television should be mounted on the wall. It used to come only with the pedestal mountings that come even now. Today also when TVs come, they come with pedestal mountings as well as wall mountings. But back then, the TVs they were selling would come only with pedestal mountings and not with wall mountings. Now, can you understand uh, that last mile user connect? A beautifully designed product, much, much superior than what existed back then. Aesthetics are also good. It is well designed also. I'm deliberately using the word design, but still not getting customer traction because the way people were using it, the way, way people were used to using a TV was very different. and they needed to train people to use this kind of a TV on a wall mounting. What happened later on is a different story, but initially Sharp lost its traction with the customers. 
and uh, uh, amongst the 80 of you, how many of you have a Sharp TV right now? That market has been completely taken over by Samsung, LG, XYZ, Sony, XYZ. So even though Sharp was the first mover, they didn't quite understand that last mile user connect. And that mistake was capitalized on by their competition. And Sharp is completely out of the market as far as TVs are concerned in a space of two decades. That's what happens without last mile user connect. Now, having uh, looked at what happens without last mile user connect, let us look at what happens with last mile user connect. All right. Uh, this is an example uh, from some of my classes that I conduct. I go as visiting faculty to a few places, uh, as Dr. Somani mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, I take courses related to entrepreneurship, new product development, uh, innovation, and strategy, etc. And uh, to put my message across, one assignment that I give common across all these courses is what I call as an empathy fortnight. Uh, what I do is very simple. If it's a class of 50 kids, I would divide them into 10 groups of five each. And each group would be given one target segment that they have to explore, interact with for the next 15 days and come back with some problems which have not yet been solved for that particular target group. So the aim is to interact, observe, empathize with that target group and identify some unsolved problems for which there will be a scope to have a solution. That's the brief to the students. One such uh, team I'm going to talk about now was uh, uh, I had given them a target group as deaf and mute housewives. Deaf and mute housewives, so not working women, only housewives. Uh, and after about three, four days, these kids came back to me saying, sir, uh, whatever ideas that we have come up with for uh, these people, for uh, speech and hearing impaired people, uh, the moment we Google it up, we find that this is not a new idea. It's already done somewhere. Uh, to which I said, you know, in this fortnight, you're not supposed to come up with ideas. You're supposed to only understand their problems, interact with them, observe them, etc. Then they said, sir, there is a problem. These people can't speak, can't hear. So it is impossible for us to interact with them. Genuine problem. Agreed. Uh, so then I said, uh, we just sat around the table. I said, let us explore some people in our known circles, if we can find any. Uh, the best way was to do was to explore our immediate families and friend circle. You know, each of us has about 50, 60 families in our known circle whom we know quite well. So six of us, that is five of them and me, one, totally six. We said, let us list down the names of families which are in our closed uh, family or friend circle. Uh, and uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes, we had a list of about 280 to 300 families on pieces of paper uh, whom we knew quite well. And then we went through each of these uh, members of the families uh, to find out whether there would be anybody who fit that bill. And we found that there were two ladies who fit that bill exactly. They were housewives and they were speech and hearing impaired. So the next question was to now go and uh, interact with these ladies uh, in their households to understand uh, what problems they face. Now then we had to decide uh, when should we go? what kinds of problems should we figure out? Then we said, we'll restrict the problems faced in the house, faced in the home, not otherwise, because we had to restrict the area. Uh, then uh, the, the next thought was, uh, in the 24 hours in a household, which is the best time that we should go so that we understand this ladies, uh, the problems that these ladies face in doing their household activities. So we, uh, were wondering when to do it, when to the first thought which came was, uh, we will go when this lady is free and she can interact with us. Uh, then the next thought was, we will, uh, but how to interact with her because she can't communicate and we don't know, we didn't know sign language. So we thought that we will go uh, when she is a little free and when there is somebody else at home who will be able to interpret uh, what's happening. But uh, then uh, if she's free, then her problems will not be visible. Then we took the other extreme that let us visit the house when she's extremely busy and she's alone at home because if there, is, there are people at home, she will get help. But we wanted to understand the real issues that she faces. So we chose a time when she would be alone at home. We chose a time between 9.30 and 
12 in the morning because by which time the kids have gone off to school, husband has gone off to work and she's busy cooking and doing her household chores in the, uh, in the home. And to add to that, we also chose days when her housemaid was on leave because we wanted to really understand what happens when all the work comes onto her head. That is the time her real problems would come out. Now, this was logically concluded and we spent that time, we spent about one and a half hours in one household and a couple of hours in the other household. And uh, we figured out very simple problems. On hindsight, they seem to be commonsensical, but they did not have a solution back then. Simple things like, you know, when the doorbell would ring, this lady would not be able to hear and she would not be able to respond. Uh, we were there in the house just to observe, not to help her at all. Just as a passive observation, we were going to understand what she's going through. Second thing we noticed was when she would put something in the microwave oven, set the timer and go to another room to do something else, to do some other activity. The microwave, after it got timed out, it would keep beeping. This lady in another room would not be able to hear that microwave beeping and it would keep beeping. That means it, nobody, she would not come back to put it off. Another peculiar thing we noticed was uh, when she would put something in the pressure cooker to cook, uh, we noticed that she would not leave the kitchen. She would pace around like a caged tiger in the kitchen itself back and forth, constantly keeping on looking at that whistle. Because she thought that if she went to another room, and if the number of whistles that she wanted the food to be cooked for, say three whistles or five whistles or whatever it is, uh, would just blow off and she would not be able to hear the whistle and uh, she would not be able to come back to put the stuff off, which means the food would get overcooked. Now, all this was observed purely as passive observers without really interfering in what she was doing. And there were a lot of other things also. And uh, afterwards, after that observation period, Within about the next seven, eight days, these students came back to me. This group of students came back to me with this kind of a product. Uh, it's a simple wristband. Uh, don't look at the aesthetics of the band at that time because of, this is the first prototype that the students had created way back in 2013. Uh, this was actually 3D printed in my lab itself back then. And uh, the aesthetics, etc., improved later on. Now, let me tell you how this functioned. This is very simple. They had embedded a simple Bluetooth module in the wristband and a similar Bluetooth module in the, all the home appliances in the house, the doorbell, pressure cooker, uh, microwave oven, etc., etc., etc. This would operate such in this way that when the doorbell would ring, the wristband in the hand of the lady would vibrate and a red LED would glow on it. If the microwave timer timed out, the wristband would vibrate and uh, maybe a light blue LED would glow on it. You can see different uh, colored LEDs on top there. If the pressure cooker uh, fifth whistle went off as per the program, uh, the wristband would vibrate and maybe a blue LED would glow on it. So this was a very simple, absolutely simple product, but solved the problem. Now, where do you think this idea came from? This idea did not come in the laboratory, neither in their classroom, nor in the library, but this observation came about only when the students spent time with the end user in her context, which is what I mean by last mile user connect. Now, I don't think this would have happened had they not spent time with the, with, with the subject, with the, with the speech and hearing impaired lady. A lot of talk was happening before, but just those one and a half hours in one house and two hours in the other house spent in the context of the user, gave them an insight into real issues. And then the solution was very simple. Now, interestingly, after this, out of the five students, two students came to me saying, oh, two students came back to me saying, sir, we are very excited with this idea and we want to take this forward. Uh, they wanted to do a startup around this. <clears throat> and a uh, lot of times, uh, many times students come. My first thing uh, to them is, I'm very happy to mentor you. Uh, one thing I tell them is take about two and a half, three weeks to think through the whole uh, product, look at competitors, look at uh, what is the general ecosystem around, 
and come back to me with some tentative steps of how you would take this forward. So my main intention is to push them to do some research on their own. These kids uh, came back to me after almost five weeks. I had given up on them. I thought they're not going to take it forward, but they came back after five weeks with, uh, and they said, uh, when they came into my lab, they seemed a little dejected, you know. Uh, they said, sir, two things uh, we have noticed uh, that kind of uh, hold us back. One is uh, back then to start a manufacturing unit in India, it needed something like 18, 19 licenses and would take about anything between 13 to 15 months to, man uh, to get those licenses. So that was one, one big dampener for these kids. Second was that uh, this product is so damn simple. Anybody can copy it. So that's, they said, we might make the first 500 or 1000 pieces. We'll be able to sell it in Mumbai and Pune and Nasik and Nagpur and stuff like that within uh, our state. Uh, but then the product is so simple that it will be duplicated. And if the Chinese folks come into the market, they will come in with thousands of such pieces or tens of thousands of such pieces at probably one fourth or half the price and we will be left nowhere. So that was now uh, the, you know, big two dilemmas and really practical uh, obstacles to taking this idea forward. Uh, credit to these two kids, they didn't give up. They used to keep coming to me and we used to brainstorm. And after about two, two and a half months uh, after this initial discussion, these kids thought of a very different way to get to the market. They said uh, product is product serves the need. We have identified some unsolved needs. And if we create a product to solve that, that's going to have a market. But the problem is with us, our inability to manufacture this. So they kept on thinking and after two and a half, three months, they said, forget about manufacturing, we will not manufacture it at all. We will make this completely open source, which means anybody in the world can manufacture a wristband embedded with a Bluetooth module, standard Bluetooth module. And they created a cloud platform. So they actually wrote some software to create a cloud platform, which enabled uh, an application programming interface. Application programming interface means an interaction with the hardware, with the cloud. And on the other side, they went to appliance manufacturers like Siemens and LG and Whirlpool and Samsung and told them that if you connect to our cloud platform through your hardware, your appliances can become deaf and mute friendly. That means your appliance can communicate with any wristband with a Bluetooth module embedded in it. That means you can claim your refrigerators and microwave ovens and washing machines and dishwashers XYZ to be deaf and mute friendly, which was a very strong value proposition for all these appliance manufacturers. And they completely got rid of the need to manufacture it themselves. So they created a very unique kind of a business model to enter the same market. Now imagine if they had entered the market by manufacturing the wristband, they would have been steamrolled by the Chinese within the first six months. But by this model, they completely eliminated the need to manufacture it and approach the same market, but through these large companies, and the large companies have a much stronger and a much wider reach to the same consumer segment. And these guys were able to do with practically zero marketing budget. If they had to go from user to user trying to sell the wristband, just imagine the kind of marketing spend that they would have to do. Now, this is something that, you know, the last mile user connect observing at the house, uh, in the house, that is last mile user connect. And after that, the next question is, how do I reach the same customer segment without having to spend too much on marketing, without by leveraging the power of somebody else who is already selling something to that same segment? How can you do that? And creating some win-win situations in the whole process. That's about uh, you know, identifying that opportunity and figuring out the technical possibilities required. And finally, it has to satisfy your business goals as well. So you really need to be at the center of product uh, user needs, 
technological capabilities and business goals if any of these three are not satisfied then your not your venture is not going to be successful so constantly think about how i'll repeat how can you be taking care of the user needs how can you be taking care of the technological possibilities and how are you going to take of take care of your own business goals if any of these three are not met the business will not remain success, successful and not will not remain sustainable so keep just keep that in mind now uh, let me uh, uh, what happens with last mile user connect in the pharmaceutical industry since you are pharma students uh, after having defined what last mile user connectivity is uh, uh, by using some other examples from other industries i would like to now come back to your industry uh, you are all are familiar with this novo pen novo nordisk uh, for insulin insulin shots for diabetic uh, patients this is somewhere in the 80s a story of the 80s not even now normally uh, how do pharma companies market their products or sell, sell their products uh, have pharma companies really come to us patients to kind of uh, sell stuff to convince them to use their stuff no they convince the doctors who will then influence the sale of their drugs and uh, equipment that they manufacture now uh, novo nordisk was in the insulin business uh, this is the story of 80s Uh, they had a good market share in europe they wanted to expand and uh, what they did was uh, they continued meeting the doctors because that is technical selling i don't need to talk about that you would be much uh, much more knowledgeable than i am in any way in that space uh, they said we will continue meeting the doctors for our sales process but over the next 6 months to 9 months we will also go out to patients to understand their needs the users need actual end users needs and uh, you know in that survey they discovered very simple things uh, they found the, and they focused on some extreme users somebody who has high diabetes and travels a lot so they followed some people in the sales jobs who had high diabetes and were constantly traveling from one place to another they would be rarely at home now these kinds of things uh, they understood that person's user journey that you know if he or she has to take insulin shots twice it has to be taken maybe an hour before lunch an hour before dinner or evening tea or whatever it is depending on the sugar levels that that person has this person who would be traveling outside his or her home city would invariably be in a hotel and that person would generally carry two sets of syringes or three sets of syringes in the morning so that he could take the insulin shots somewhere an hour before lunch an hour before the evening tea or hour before dinner or whatever it is that dosage would be now back then there were no disposable syringes so this person would have to boil or sterilize these sets of syringes in his or her hotel room carry these in three boxes and use them at different times but anything that is whatever sterilized autoclaved left around for half an hour is going to get desterilized so something that is being used in the afternoon or evening is not going to be sterilized so so now after having understood this problem these guys actually came up with these kind of clicking pens back then and then introduced these in the market for initially for people who would to travel etc for whom for whom convenience was a big big deal and they introduced these in the market and the way they introduced was that initially they launched these novo pens they gave it free with to people who bought 3 months of their quota of insulin shots which meant that for 3 months these people locked the customer in to their own uh, to their own uh, uh, offering and later on automatically once people got used to this convenience automatically they came back to novo nordisk itself and in those 3 or 4 months of their initial launch when people started buying in bulk competitors started losing their immediate market share by the time the competition really realized what was happening 
they had lost a lot of loyalty from the customers and gradually in the space of the next three years Novo Nordisk almost doubled their uh, sales in the in the continent of Europe in a space of three years. Now this is also a classic example of last mile user connect, understanding the end user, not just the uh, middle person. In pharma industry, the doctor is the middle person, though a large, a very heavy influencer, but many pharmaceutical companies even today do not really focus on the end user. So look at, start looking at that end user, you will get real ideas for good product services from there. Let me take another example. This is something uh, which we were working with a pharma company way back in 2007, 2008, et cetera. And they wanted to kind of climb up the number. They wanted to be the number one player in India, number three player in the world and things like that. I won't name that company. Uh, it's under an NDA. Now, back then, uh, they were in this anti-diabetic uh, drugs and they wanted to be they wanted to increase their revenue big time so staying with the diabetic uh, range of medicines would not possibly have gone there so the next question that we asked was uh, which is the customer segment which consumes maximum medicines uh, the natural answer is senior citizens so we started understanding senior citizen behavior and things like that and we realized, you know, some commonsensical things, but we discovered it when we met these people. Most of these people are living alone. Some of them are uh, couples. Some of them are alone because one of the couples has expired. Um, their children are all over the country in different corners of the country, different corners of the world. Uh, as age progresses, uh, forgetfulness starts coming in. Um, a lot of these people, because they are retired, they want to save money. They have sold their main house in the center of the city and have moved to the suburbs. So their reach to hospitals is that much further uh, because uh, hospitals in the city, mostly good hospitals are somewhere around the city center. Out in the suburbs, their, their time to hospital to reach, etc. is more. Plus, <clears throat> We observe one very peculiar uh, uh, thing in their uh, regular activities. Almost every evening or every alternate evening, they would get a phone call from one of their children who would be staying in any corner of the globe. And they would carry on the conversation. And one of the most common questions without fail, the child would ask the parent, have you taken today's medicines? Have you taken today's medicines or not? So the child would be worried whether the regimen has been taken properly or not. All these things started coming up. And then we started looking at, rather than introducing new drugs, we started focusing on the convenience aspect of uh, these, uh, you know, of, of these uh, senior citizens. So first uh, thing was very simple, a uh, multi-strip, uh, you know, uh, multi-medicine in one strip. I don't need to explain, simple thing. Uh, then we said, uh, they, what if they forget to take that also? So instead of one capsule being forget, one tablet being forgotten, the whole, all four or five tablets will be forgotten. Then uh, the question was that the conversation in the beginning, uh, when we were doing that research, that, we really, that suddenly came to our mind that the children staying across the world they are worried whether their, their parents have taken that specific, uh, I mean, the, the medicines for the day or not. So then what we said was to enter that uh, senior citizen space. Uh, right now, if we don't have the drugs to enter that senior citizen space, can we enter it in any other way? And what came out was that let us capitalize on the convenience and the forgetfulness of these people and the worry that these children have, whether their parents have taken medicines or not. So what we did was we tied up with these caregiving agencies, that particular company. Caregiving agencies are, you know, the agencies which provide nurses, ward boys at home to take care of elderly people. Like, you know, if we have some elderly person having undergone some surgery and who needs 24 hour attention, we generally employ somebody from these caregiving agencies in eight hour shifts to come and have a look at, uh, to, to keep a track of the, the senior citizen at home. So these are the caregiving agencies. Now, this company tied up with these caregiving agencies uh, such that the, a member from the caregiving agency would come to the home 
of these elderly citizens, administer the medicines, and there we, they had created a web portal back in 2008 uh, when there were no applications, there were no apps on mobile phones and things like that. And when the person from that caregiving agency would administer the medicine, he or she would log into that website that today's quota done. And once that information would be entered, an SMS text would go to the child sitting anywhere in the corner of the world, such that say uh, today's medicines had taken at this this time. You know, so, so now with this kind of an arrangement, the company was able to enter that senior citizen space without really introducing newer and newer drugs, which take a lot of time, R&D, etc., etc. So they entered that senior citizen space back then with this application way before the, you know, app kind of mobile apps had come into the picture. Now, <clears throat> this is what I mean by, you know, understanding the issues at the last mile and coming up with ideas that uh, can help you penetrate markets, which competition thinks are saturated. But there is always something or the other that is unsolved, unsaid also, unarticulated also, which you as entrepreneurs need to tap and create offerings and services around it. <clears throat> uh, so one lesson from here is uh, normally uh, when we do our user surveys, we focus on the mean plus minus two sigma. All statistics, statistics profs and marketing profs have taught us that our representative sample that has to be studied is mean plus minus two standard deviations, correct? Representative sample. But in all these cases that you must have seen, even when my students went to study the deaf and mute housewives, they went at extreme situations, extreme scenarios. That means when that lady was alone at home, she would be very busy. And on days when the housemaid was also, an absent, was also absent. So they actually focused on these outlier extreme situations. And that's where the ideas came about. Uh, even in this uh, pharmaceutical example, we focused on the extremely forgetful people who would forget taking medicines. And that's where that idea came from. And this idea actually was uh, useful for patients, even without that forgetfulness, because their children would always be worried. And with that, they actually entered a market which they, were, which, which they didn't have so much entry to begin with and not necessarily with conventional drugs. So there are multiple ways in which you can enter the same market by providing additional value added services, X, Y, Z. And uh, once again, the point to be noted is that uh, this was done about 12 years back when this mobile app culture did not exist. So somebody visualized those kinds of things purely on the basis of connecting with that end user at the last mile. All right, now uh, let me, uh, kind of, you know, upcoming trends, customized medicine. Uh, today, wearables uh, can track a lot of parameters in our body. Uh, why should a patient, a diabetic patient, should take a standard regimen every single day? If the sugar has fallen, insulin uh, input maybe go, should go down. If the sugar has risen, the insulin input should go up. So why, why does the person have to take absolutely the same MG every single day? It should actually vary basis, yesterday's readings, etc. And now to make this happen, a lot of high tech will be required, but there are medium stages where, you know, one can actually through the wearables actually give that feedback to the consulting doctors. And it can be, there could be an intelligent algorithm, which actually keeps on adjusting the next day's medicines, depending on, uh, uh, on uh, what the readings have been the previous day. And I'm not talking about only about diabetics, but these intermediate kind of solutions could come out from uh, for different diseases as well. Because uh, normally uh, a doctor prescribes a standard for standard prescription because there is no way of monitoring in today's situation. But the technology exists and this is not very expensive technology. It needs a combination of understanding of biomechanics, understanding of anatomy, physiology, and uh, technology. That needs to get combined. Another thing is, uh, you know, 
today insurance companies now imagine the situation suppose me and a friend say i am person a and person b we go to an insurance company to buy an insurance policy uh, beyond a certain value of insurance a medical test is mandatory say both of us go to the insurance company to buy an insurance policy of the same amount and on the same day and naturally both of us will be asked to do medical examinations now coincidentally imagine both of our medical parameters came the same my sugar level is x his sugar level is also x so naturally the risk level is the same for both the, both the uh, insurers uh, i mean uh, the uh, insurees uh, insurance buyers naturally the premium fixed for that insurance policy will also be the same now tomorrow onwards suppose i don't comply with my anti diabetic therapy my friend com complies very very strictly eats regulatedly takes his medication on time and i am the other extreme my sugar levels keep on fluctuating his sugar levels are maintained properly even fall down but at the end of the year both of us end up paying the same premium he is a much lower risk for that insurance company whereas me i am a much higher risk for the insurance company now should i should we both be paying the same insurance policy i mean insurance commission obviously not the uh, insurance company will actually lose on me and gain on him so the insurance premium also needs to get adjusted accordingly would you agree with that now this can be made possible in various ways one of the most obvious ways is that if the insurance company uh, if the amount of insurance bought the uh, the uh, whatever insurance policy value if it is above a certain level maybe the insurance company can give a variable band which tracks health parameters for both of us and it gets fed to the cloud my parameters keep fluctuating his parameters stay steady the insurance company's algorithm calculates the risk my risk profile is high his risk profile is low and at the end of the next year his insurance premium actually should come down mine should go up that's the way the insurance company then balances its risks out and uh, it's a win win situation for everybody my friend because he or she complies well with the therapy gets an incentive me who doesn't comply with the therapy gets a reminder the boss now you better be careful your health is failing so it's an incentive for me to kind of come back to a proper regimen and for the insurance company it's a much minimized risk in terms of uh, the uh, premium calculation and things like that so that's once again a win win situation uh, coming up now there is there are lots of opportunities there uh, provided we are willing to take a multidisciplinary approach pharma biomedical engineering and information technology together gives a lot of uh, scope to you know for some new offerings to come out with and believe me this is not really high tech stuff it is happening we just have to be able to connect these three fields and kind of create solutions which are in the sweet spot here Uh, i will stop here and we can take questions and uh, you can uh, uh, read uh, more about such things in my recently published book uh, just published in uh, may uh, 2020 uh, and i am ready to take questions now whatever the questions are yeah uh, thank you dr kostub it was really a wonderful uh, session particularly with reference to the Uh, the examples what you quoted and the concept of design thinking uh, through the examples you know so so uh, i mean uh, this session let's let's ask first to students then probably i have couple of questions which i can sure. ask you later on so uh, yeah students uh, session is uh, open for the question answer anyone any question hope you understand understood the topic of design thinking still if the, even if there is a, any any kind of uh, 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 small question or kind of uh, simple question you can ask here please i would be glad if student ask the questions can i please go to the last yes. slide yes anyone yeah there is a message here uh, isha chudasma saying uh, can you please go to the last slide yes there it is on screen
Yeah, you have a question, Adam? Uh, no, sir, I don't have any question. I just wanted to look for the uh, slide function. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, Dr. Kosto, I would like to ask you. Sure. And on behalf of this, all students, basically, whatever question I'm going to ask, particularly for students. So, uh, very important point you said in your talk that uh, uh, design thinking is a kind of uh, end user centric, iterative uh, process and ex exploring approach, particularly. Now, you also talk about extremes, right? Yeah. So, when you say about extremes, so now uh, my, my question is now when you are talking about an idea generation, how this extreme situation can be imagined, can be thought of? Because we are talking about generation of idea and we are thinking about extremes. So how this thing can be balanced, actually speaking? Uh, well, uh, uh, I would say that before we really understand the problem, we should not really get into ideation. Uh, because understanding the problem from the user's perspective is very important. Many times we define the problem from our understanding. But when we actually go in the field and with the user, we figure out that the user has a very completely different set of problems. Mm -hmm. So after having understood those problems, only then one should actually start generating ideas. So getting into that user's shoes is extremely important. Now, uh, the extreme scenarios which I mentioned was that uh, because, you know, the extreme users stretch the product to such a limit that the medium users never think of. And the demands of the extreme user actually throws up some features for the products which we could not have ever imagined even through doing some thorough research with median kind of, you know, users. Mm -hmm. So that's where, uh, you know, this, this normally all our research is focused on this bell curve, the mid, middle, of, middle of the bell curve. Yeah. The outliers we have been systematically told to ignore. <laughs> I mean, our education system has always told us to ignore the outliers. But <laughs> these are the people who subject the system to the maximum extreme and help us envisage uh, some features which these people in the center can never imagine. And what happens is that when such features come in and if we can introduce that, it creates a big competitive edge over the competition. And the median segment people also are willing to pay a higher price for these features, you know. So, so then the question, there is one more question by a student, Chahat, you can take it. Yeah. In the chat box. Sorry. Sh shall I read the question for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just, yeah, I can. Achha, you are explaining this? No, no, no. I mean, uh, I am just ex accessing yeah. the chat link. For becoming an entrepreneur from a level where we are not able to go in the field and identify, then how can we do design thinking? Well, uh, I mean, uh, if you are solving a problem for a person, uh, if you cannot understand the problem, then how can you become an entrepreneur? Point number one. So is there, is there really an option to, to, to kind of understand the real problems? There is none. So if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to be able to figure out problems from the user's perspective. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you are, all of you must be knowing this chain called Food Hall, right? Big Bazaar, uh, okay, uh, you know, big future group, Food Hall. Yeah, it's a yeah. better mall yeah. with high-end high high-end food products. Right. You know, I have seen, who's the founder of Future Group? Mr. Kishore Biani, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. You know, in my visits to Food Hall, twice, once at the Bandra location and once at the Phoenix small location, High Street Phoenix location, I have seen Mr. Kishore Biani himself standing in the corner observing what is going on in his store. What are people buying? What are people's habits? I mean, a man who is worth probably 35,000 crores, 30, 35,000 crores. And this is in the last two years. Huh? 
not when uh, he was uh, early in his uh, entrepreneurial days. I'm talking okay. about 2019, 2018. Now, do I have I answered your question, Chahat Bindal? Uh, sir, actually, my question was basically around the fact that people say that we can become entrepreneur when we are from student life. We are uh, so, either yeah. from first year or second year. So, yeah. but in this age, we are not able to access the market and Why find not? out the people. Why not? Who stops you? Who stops so you? So, is it from... possible? Why not? I mean, there's so many kids. Uh, in, I mean, this I told you uh, that wristband fellows, they were students. Another, another chap, I'll tell you, you know, uh, this was in one, uh, one B school in Delhi. I don't remember this uh, name way back in 2009 or sometime. Okay. Uh, I had given them a very simple assignment, go out on the streets and identify some opportunity, some problems that you can solve. And it was the winter season somewhere in January, February, there is a lot of fog in Delhi. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so this guy noticed that, you know, people, uh, in their for their vehicles cars uh, normally people use a fog light you know that yellow colored orange yes. colored fog light no, but yes, it's expensive sir. it is expensive you know it varies from anything between two and a half thousand to twenty thousand rupees depending on the brand of fog light that you buy so people don't want to spend that amount so what people do is you know people cut out uh, a orange gelatin paper and stick it on their uh, this thing headlight because simple logic, white light, say, orange light travels faster. I mean, it travels longer. Wavelength is longer, so it, it deeper penetration. Simple scientific logic. Now, this guy came back and applied a little bit of his engineering understanding and actually he created stickers of that gelatin paper uh, exactly to the size of the three most popular models in Delhi back then. One was Wagonar, one was Swift, and the third one I don't remember now. I think Hyundai Sancho. He created these three sets and started selling it at roadside junctions through, you know, through these, uh, uh, through, through the people who beg actually, mm -hmm. the homeless people. And also started selling it through mechanics and things like that in his known circle. And I forgot about the whole thing because I had gone there as a visiting faculty. And the next year, about six months later, sometime in June or July, he, this guy calls me up and say, tells me, sir, you know, this for my second year of MBA, I don't have to take fees from my dad. What does that tell you? So that he <laughs> made money by selling that. Yeah, back then, back then, uh, 2010, 2011, I think the fees were probably three lakhs or something per year. That means he made a profit of about three, four lakhs selling that in that winter season as a student. No, yes. And many, many startup, you know, have been found by the yes, uh, students only yeah. and probably they they succeeded because they started from their students life itself yeah, yeah yeah there's another boy another i mean i can tell you enough examples students who have churned out into you know good decently run decently uh, decent sized businesses in the last four or five years one of my students uh, from amaravati uh, has some farmers in his family. His family is not a farming family, but uh, you know, mama, chacha types. And he used to go and stay with their uh, with them in the vacations and things. Like that. And he understood. He identified one problem that they would have to get up late at night when the water used to come mm -hmm. to go in the water, go in the field, press the button for the pump to start, etc., etc., etc. This was way back in 2012, 2013. Uh, so he created a mobile uh, phone app which could control these uh, water pumps through a mobile phone. Very simple thing. Nothing new. A lot of people were doing it. Now, uh, but back then it was kind of, kind of new, though not a very new idea. So he figured out, he created that and started selling it. Then he figured out that this giant irrigation is the big player in the market. And entering that same space was very difficult for him. So he actually went and stayed with these people, even other than vacation time, to understand the real issues. And he identified a lot of issues that later on came in extremely handy to him. When this uh, two, 2014, the government changed, 2015-16, uh, at that time, these guys, this government wanted to control the subsidies to farmers. Earlier subsidies used to just go away without any accountability. So the government wanted accountability to be for the subsidies to be given. So now with this simple device with which we had, which he had penetrated the market, 
he started monitoring the water usage, electricity usage by the farmers. And that information was very useful for government to actually determine what amount of subsidy should be given, water subsidy should be given to a specific farmer, how much of electric subsidy should be given to a specific farmer, electricity subsidy. And it started becoming much, much more pointed. And automatically the government has now become his, uh, state governments have become his customers. And now he, in addition to just monitoring electricity consumption and water consumption, now this fellow has also tied up with soil sensor hardware people. That is, now the government has also in, uh, introduced crop insurance, right? For which they need to know the health of the soil, health of the field, of every acre of land that the farmer owns to be able to offer soil insu uh, crop insurance accordingly. Now soil monitoring also needs to be done and that information also needs to go to the government. So now he's tied up with soil uh, sensor uh, you know, companies to use his platform to capture that information about the soil and pass it on to uh, the uh, government. I mean, classic example of last mile user connect. When did he start? He started in his, at the end of his first year, it was a two year MBA program, 12, 14 batch, started out somewhere in the middle of, uh, at the beginning of 2013 and gradually he's grown. Uh, so he started off as a student. So many examples are there. And you can Google up Smart Kheti. Right now you can Google up Smart Kheti. His name is Tanul Mohod. Uh, you will find uh, on his website what all he does. And today uh, he has orders to the tune of, you know, five, 6,000 pieces from one state government along with that cloud platform. So uh, there, is, there is another question, sir, yes. uh, which is actually asked to me by a student, but I will just, uh, I don't know. I mean, probably he has uh, put the question to me. I'll just read the question. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, as you said, the future of pharma industry depends on advanced technology, but in most of the pharmacy colleges in India, a very typical and basic machinery is used in laboratories. So how much time can one expect? How much time can one expect so that technology can actually have an impact on pharma industry? So I don't understand what exactly he wants to say, but probably, yeah. So what is the impact? How much time it will require for technology to impact the pharma industry? That is a question it has come out. I think he is probably saying that we don't have the infrastructure in pharmaceutical colleges. Is that, I think that's what he means, the question. What I feel is, uh, now these examples which I gave you, these ones, now they don't need really big infrastructure in terms of uh, some technology infrastructure in a pharmaceutical college. This needs an understanding of wearable technologies, which is, which is very cheap, which is available on the cloud. Uh, there are lots of online programs where you can familiarize yourself with simple yeah. programming. It is not complicated. It doesn't need, uh, it doesn't need fancy laboratory equipment to be able to do it. Uh, when it is drug discovery, yes, you need a lot of laboratory equipment, a lot of software, recombinants, this, that, all that kind of stuff. Yes. But for these kinds of use cases that we spoke about, though they look, seem to be high tech, but it, it really doesn't need too much of hardware there. You know, it is a lot of it is off the shelf technology. So the point uh, that one we have to keep in mind is identify use cases. That means what are the problems that users are facing and look for appropriate technology which is not necessarily hardware driven. Yeah, so sir, uh, just to close the session further, I have one question again on the behalf of the students and probably uh, we'll go to summarize, summarize it now. How to look into the problems? That is the question into the, because idea will come from understanding the problem. So when, what are, what are the strategies should be used to uh, understand the problem? See, broadly, what is your interest area as a student? You will have some interest area. I want to work in X field or Y field or Z field. That much, uh, you know, that's the starting point. And then in that field, who are the possible end users? Who are the possible 
users who are the possible competitors who are their users if you can narrow it down on that and then actually observe and interact with these people to understand their real issues what problems have been solved by x competitor what problems have been solved by y, y competitor what are people complaining about uh, the the best way to identify opportunities is to identify what people are complaining about but and believe me uh, to get people to complain is not very difficult you just have to needle them once and people can come out with a bunch of complaints just get into the habit of noting down these complaints you might have a database of complaints and maybe sometime you might find a big opportunity coming out from that complaint so uh, i believe that today's complaints or today's pain points are tomorrow's opportunities yeah true very rightly said so uh, probably we have to keep our eyes and ears open Absolutely. to observe the things so that we understand the problems Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much sir for your insights and i request uh, isha our first year student isha chudasama to please take uh, uh, give the conclusions and your observations of the session uh, so isha please yes sir uh, am i audible yeah uh, okay so firstly i would like to thank uh, dr kostub sir to actually invest his time here today saturday afternoon for giving us so much of information about design thinking so am i like supposed to summarize the session sir yeah just quick quickly okay so uh, basically design thinking is what you need to um, like is a problem solving approach as uh, uh, sir rightly said uh, and and empathize design uh, ideate and prototype and test is one of the basic uh, building block of this design thinking uh, it is important to actually um, focus on the extremes also because that is really important for a uh, growing uh, country if we see and um, majorly um, this was like a wonderful session sir so thank you so much uh, so so i'll just add here that all students should note some great examples quoted by him you know about sharp electronics example the television set then wristband and then the appliances for deaf and mute uh, uh, customers through large companies like philips and other thing then uh, your novo pen and most importantly the web portal for the elderly patients so these are the examples which have these are the products which have come out of uh, observations of the the problems of these people and that is how the products have come out i think it was good learning session sir for us hope uh, we will have one more time some some other time uh, more deep insight and deep interaction with you thank yeah. you so much for your thank presence you. here bye bye thank, thank you, you. so thank you students uh, and hope you enjoyed it uh, give a feedback uh, separately on a piece of paper later on i'll share the feedback form with you thank you so much uh, we'll close the meeting sir yeah